Welcome to CivilNet. My guest today is Tomas Gorgisian, a journalist who works with Egyptian newspapers, Arab uh, news outlets, uh, an Egyptian Armenian who lives in Washington, D.C. Tomas, welcome to CivilNet. It's you. And in trying to decide what it is we're going to talk about, it occurs to me we could talk about any one of three topics, and maybe we'll talk about all three of them. It's up to you. Ask it, and I will answer. Um, you're an Egyptian Armenian from a very interesting, old, uh, dignified uh, intellectual community. It's worth reminiscing, talking about that and where that community is today in the Egyptian reality. Okay. You were a correspondent in Washington, part of the International Press Corps, mm. and what that means. And if we have time, maybe we talk also about this dichotomy or complementarity between traditional media and social media, especially since you're from Egypt. Okay, I have to use three hats now. Three hats. Let's start with the last hat, huh? Okay. Um, we talk about this a lot in Armenia as well, that now that there's social media, now that there's citizen journalism, uh, somehow things will be better explained, more informational and so forth. On the other hand, in the absence of solid, real, dependable, reliable, serious, intelligent, interesting, all of these adjectives, traditional media, do we have the background necessary to use all this other technology? Uh, it's, it's nice to have, like, let's say, I, I call it uh, sarcastically, it's nice to have a lot of colleagues, but doesn't mean that I have to agree with all my colleagues in their uh, practicing of the profession, which is, uh, which is usually, it's a matter of the tool. I mean, I mean, as we say, okay, everybody has an iPhone or an iPad, but what you are using for, or everybody on Facebook or Internet, how you, go, uh, how you navigate. In Egypt, how did they navigate? In fact, in, in face of a traditional media that was rather reserved. Yes. Did it work? It worked. It worked. I mean, but it's, it's as we say, it triggers something. It, it rocked the boat. It's, uh, as we call it, if you call it, uh, it's an Egyptian temple. It, ca it can shake the columns of this temple. But at the end, uh, uh, then what? I mean, then what? I can uh, tweet you, let's say, or say, send you an email, but doesn't mean that I inform you. I, maybe I let you know. But as we know in generally, when we talk about these things about, and, and we are, I'm trying to like broaden the un understanding of the media. I mean, it's not, I mean, okay, information, information is not knowledge. It's part of the knowledge. So and knowledge is not wisdom. It's part of the wisdom. So we used information when it was time to trigger a change. Change, and then, and then you, but you have to channel this. And now we make, have to govern, now we have yes. to build a state. Yes, and then the, the other thing, which is, which is media, social media problem, people usually, and especially with the Facebook, you see everybody is looking at, at the mirror. I mean, at the mirror that they see themselves. And they consider this is a big, great idea. I mean, journalism in general was not looking through the mirror, looking through the window or through from the balcony or going to the street and reflect people's life. It's not just my life or how I think or how I feel and how I assume, you know. Has traditional media in Egypt uh, adapted to this new situation? Yes, Are they a better window now than they yes, were? Yes, 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 indeed. I mean, it's like becoming more, more like reporting. It's becoming as, as trying to imitate the British or American or European somehow experience, which is like, okay, when you write a story, you don't write just to inform people something or just, just to say, oh, so-and-so said this. You try to figure out, put in a context. As we say it in a different an analogy that I usually, usually use, okay, you can see the tree, but you have to see the wood. The forest, okay. sure. And the forest, whatever. Uh, sure. And, uh, and it's, you cannot say... And Twitter and Facebook yeah, have a hard time doing that. Yeah, I mean, like I'm now talking to you, but I can see the cameraman who is shooting me. Shooting me doesn't mean that killing me. And in the same time, I see the, the television and the book and the bookshelf and all these things. This is the whole idea oh. of, let's say, the new role of the media, which is to let the people understand or how to help the people to make their own decisions in their own everyday life. How I do it, that's the issue. And that's the complementarity that between and the as, traditional as, as, and as, the And in order to make it in the nutshell, at the end, people have to be trained to do that. I mean, it's not a matter just I know how to use internet or tweet or whatever. I mean, I have to be, as I say, always I make a joke with some junior journalist friends or I have colleagues who I can call them. I said, try to show your wisdom in 
140 characters, but not hide your stupidity, you know? Okay, we're going to move on. <laughs> move on. Um, you're a member of the Washington Press Corps. Yeah. Uh, you're from a country or a part of the world that is uh, not France and Germany, huh? No. How's that? Does that, is your job easy? Do you get information? Are you in the back row? You know, I mean, I mean, I mean I'm not usually in the back row, I mean, but usually, I mean, we try to figure out how to ask the question, of course. It's getting, it's getting harder now, not for us, for all the journalists in Washington, because as we call it, the, the spinning is, is really fast, you know, it's why I mean, and usually if you notice that, uh, for example, the White House uh, spokesperson, there was the former bureau chief of Time magazine in Washington. So it's like they are getting whatever they can, whoever is, uh, I mean, can be used in order to, as we Better call it, spin. and yeah, and then the, for years ago there was a an expression used by the White House how to tame the beast, you know. I mean, the journalists are beasts, you know, and then you are trying to tame them and and they to channel them, and of course usually they are good answers, but doesn't mean answering your questions, you know what I mean? You do receive answers. Yeah, that's the point. I mean, usually my colleagues all over the world, and especially in, let's say, I don't like to put a third, fourth, five, fifth country, world countries, but generally people, they don't like questions. Officially, they don't that's like That's how questions. it is in Armenia. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I assume so. I mean, and it's especially, you, there are two things. Officials in all over the world, they don't like questions. And always they like to, to let the people have short memory. I mean, if the journalists say, oh, but you say this two weeks ago, oh, no, I didn't say it. Who said that? Whatever. So in, in, in this atmosphere, of course, relatively speaking, it's much easier for me to get some answer to my questions in Washington. And then there is the right to ask. I mean, nobody, I have friends yes. in Egypt or other countries, we, because we follow the case of the how to protect the committee to protect journalists and all these people, we are working together. I mean, there are places that people just ask a question after five minutes or 10 minutes, or as an Iranian journalist once said, it, the, the freedom of expression is not that I'm asking a question or writing my article, is, I, is, is, the, is my right to go back freely to my back home. After I ask after the question. After I ask the question. And this is, this is the time interval that is always used by authorities. And there, I mean, as always I said, we have to ask ourselves to know at least, that was always I try to teach people around me, how to avoid the manipulation of authorities to media people. Because once you know how you can be manipulated, you may a little bit manipulate with them or maneuver with them. Yeah, and in your case manipulation is both the sophisticated spinning and as well as the oh, yeah. very rough Middle Eastern sort of manipulation. You pick up the phone, talk to you, you say, oh, okay, if you, you, may, you may face another reality, whatever, cut in your salary or kicked out of the job and let's say there is a long line waiting for to replace you. I mean, these are expressions. I'm How has the perception of Egypt, Egyptian journalists, but Egypt specifically changed in Washington from Mubarak to post-Mubarak and revolution and now to Morsi. Is it a curve or is it still on the rise? I mean, it's, it's, I, I cannot say on the rise, I'm, but it, it, it was rising and then it started to allow swinging, you know, it's like uh, back and forth, you know, especially, but uh, I mean, in all these cases, what I, can, what I can say, I mean, nobody can ignore or let's say, uh, ignore the, the, the significance of Egypt and the Egyptian people. I mean, they may agree or not agree what's going on. Definitely they criticize, but always they are, it's too much, it's too big to handle, you know, I don't know how to handle it. This is, this is really what is, in this, especially in the last four, six months with this new uh, Morsi, I mean, in power, in, which is mainly to put all the power in his hands, people become in Washington officially speaking as at least. And then of course with the think tanks, people start to talk about how he has to be part of the reality or the, the, the demands or the aspirations of the people that they were in Tahrir Square eight, for 18 days. So it's like this kind of, definitely what was done in Tahrir Square in 2011, people still remember, 
and they were uh, very inspiring and very uh, educative, but it doesn't mean, I mean, it's like, I mean, there are, as we say in Egypt, there are other squares in life, you know, not just one square, and 18 days is not my life. It's just a portion of my life. There is, has to be 18 days after. I mean, there are 18 months, 18 years, and all these things. You know, those of us living in Armenia often say that one of the reasons that it's really important that this country develop and develop well in the right direction, in the right way, is because at the end of the day, each of us is judged wherever you live, in Washington or in Cairo, by this country. Oh, yeah. You know, if this becomes not a third world country, but a fifth world country, people are going to look at me and go, oh, she's from over there. And if it is not, if it... Now, do you get that? When the Egyptian hype was high, you were the new Democrat, and now when it's not quite clear how Egyptian politics is but going to go? I don't look in that way. I mean, I, I look for inspiring moments. I mean, it's like... For me, that 18 days of Tahrir Square, like what was going on in 1988 here. I mean, I'm not trying to compare which is better or worse. I mean, but it's like, and then it was the same wherever in Tiananmen Square when the guys st stood in front of the tank. It was the same when the, it was uh, the Iran in two, two years ago or three years ago. I mean, it's all these things. It's like people are building up human, human nature or human beings supposed to be beings, you know, it's not just like something, a name or a number. So they learn from each other and then it's inspiring moments. How old were you when you left Egypt? I was in early 30s and uh, that's it. I mean, I didn't leave Egypt as a matter of fact, I took Egypt with me. How do and, you do that? I mean, simply by, because I was, I mean, I don't consider that 30 years that I was living in Egypt like a past something, I can put it aside like a, an old shoes or an old pants or whatever. I mean, it was part of my culture. As, as I said, I was Armenian at home and uh, Egyptian at streets. And, uh, and simply because for me, it was not just like, as I say, identity is not just a paper or piece of paper. I mean, it was part of my identity. I am part of the Egyptian culture, a piece of Egyptian literature. I have hundreds and thousands of friends. They read my works and I read my, their works. The Egypt that you left, uh -huh. the Egypt that you took with you, that you remember, uh -huh. is today's Egypt as well? I mean, it gets a little bit, uh, it's like all of us, I mean, there are some wrinkles on the, our face and uh, forehead and all these things, I mean, it's different. But because it, from that time, I didn't cut my relation, I mean, I'm every year almost there, and I'm in touch with the young generation, old generations, and I always remember reminding them, I mean, rem remembering and reminding, of? of what is Egypt because you know as I told I mean it's for me it's the same like what is Armenia I mean for me Armenia because it's not as, as we if you call it Armenia is a if it's like a fixed I mean I mean like as we say countries are place for people and people are moving nations so for me Armenia is like whatever is for me is Armenia is what you have in you. In you. In uh, what I feel it about it, how I learned. I don't, I mean, maybe there are things that are going on more than what I'm expecting, but for me, Baruch Sevag is Baruch Sevag, is Parachanov is Parachanov, Siamanto is Siamanto, Sayatnova is Sayaman. And it may be not be the same as you, what you think, but this is what I, and then, then when I come here, and even I will move around, I look to many things that people are not looking for it. I, and I don't argue with that. Because this is, this is my experience. This is my experience with being an Armenian, an Egyptian, and now an American, and all these things. I mean, I, I don't see it. People usually, they try to make it like separate. I mean, it's like- No more, those days it's, are gone. It's not, I mean, that's not the case. I mean- Those days are absolutely I mean, gone, and Tomas Gorgisian is a good example of that. I don't know if a good or bad, but it's-, it's a, You're a good example of that. <laughs> Thank you for joining us on Civil Debt. We've been talking with Tomas Gorgisian, who is a correspondent for various Egyptian and Arab news outlets, lives in Washington, D.C., and is philosophical about all of the things that it means uh, to be a journalist today, an Egyptian today, an Armenian today. Thank you for following us on CivilNet.